Hello, and welcome to An Evening with Distillery, the VFX of The Last of Us. I'm your host this evening, taking a break from watching Jujutsu Kaisen. My name is Chris Holly. I know I had to throw in that anime reference, and I'm, I'm not sure there are many of you, you in here that watch anime, but if you do, you should check it out. And uh, if you do watch anime and want to prove me wrong that I mislabeled you, go ahead and tell me your favorite anime in the chat. For those of you that need closed captionings, go ahead and check out our Facebook or YouTube. And uh, here we are. I, I gotta, I gotta say, I've been waiting for this day. I'm a huge fan of The Last of Us. I played The Last of Us on PS3. I played it again on PS4. I played it again on PS5. When they announced that the show was uh, even in production, that it was coming out, I was so, so, so excited. And then, and then I watched it, and I, I mean, it was it was just it was unlike so many shows that I that I had ever seen. And in uh, one episode in particular that that we'll get into talking about today was probably one of the best pieces of television that I've seen in a very very long time. So I'm sure all of you here are very excited to also talk about The Last of Us and check out all the amazing stuff that our guests have done. So I'll, I'll stop delaying it. I'll stop talking about anime and how much I love The Last of Us and how I prefer throwing bricks versus trying to actually fight clickers. Because if you're trying to fight clickers, you, you're, you're, you're a crazy person. You're a crazy person. I'm always running. I'm always running. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce our guest, Distillery Effects. How are you guys doing? D Distillery VFX. How are you all doing? Good man, how are you doing? Thanks for having us. Good we really thanks. appreciate this. Oh yeah, I'm 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 so excited. I see the amazing uh, helmets in the background and the amazing posters in the background. We're all set up. We're all here. We're all ready to nerd and geek out. So I'm glad that we all understood the assignment for today. <laughs> so why don't I go ahead and let you all take it away and tell us a little bit about distillery. Go ahead and introduce yourselves and who you all are and and what you all uh, what you all do. Cool. Um, I'm John Mitchell. I'm a VFX supervisor and one of the founders of Distillery. Yeah, my name is Pedro Santos. I'm a CG supervisor here at Distillery VFX. And I'm Aaron Barr, and I'm an environment soup at Distillery. Fantastic. So I know you all brought some uh, stuff for us, but before we get into that, Distillery. So, I mean, you're here. Might as well ask you. The name, how, what, what's, what, where did that come from? How did you, are you like, you know, I really like liquor and I think that's a cool name. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Was that the, I'm assuming that was, <laughs> that was not it. A lot of people think that, I mean, like we, we do, we do have a couple, you know, beer kegs on different floors of the studio. Cause we do like to have our, you know, we like to have our drink on Friday, but um, it's actually born from a process, you know, uh, and I'll talk about this in a little bit when I talk a little bit more about where we came from, but um, we've worked at a lot of very big studios. And one thing that we always like to do when we, when we do our work is refining what you're doing each time, you know, you don't want to do the same thing over and over again and bang your head against the wall. So it's more about refining the process down into something finer and then doing it again and again until you get better and better and better and better until you have the finest kind of thing at the end. That's kind of the idea behind it. Ooh, that's exciting. I, go, I got chills, I got goosebumps. That was, <laughs> that was, that was awesome. So I'll let, I'll let you all take it away and, uh, and, and, and go right ahead. Cool, yeah. So I think we're gonna show a little teaser here in a few minutes about just a little, uh, you know, to get us going, to look at a little bit of our work that we've done together. Um, Distillery is a fairly new studio. We started in twenty nine, late 2019. Um, myself and a few very close colleagues of mine, uh, Greg Kegel and Matt Lane and Troy Tyler. Uh, we were at very big studios. We'd been there for a long time. We worked at ILM, Industrial Light and Magic together for a very long time, you know, five, six years. Greg and Matt were there even longer. Um, we got to know each other really well there. Uh, there's a lot of things that we found, you know, we like to do together on shows. Um, there's a style of approach. There's a generalist approach to work that we really like. Um, and we kind of decided 
we should split off and attempt to do our own thing. You know, we spent a lot of years at very large places. I come from a smaller background. Originally, I used to do commercial work. Um, I started in the industry with a very small studio called Frantic Films. Um, a lot of people won't know what that is anymore. Um, you, you'll have to go back in the time machine for that one. Um, you know, Greg used to work at Blur for a long time. Um, Matt had worked at a lot of different smaller studios around town. So we had this kind of want to go back to a smaller focused boutique and do something on our own terms, the way that we felt like we wanted to do stuff. You know, part of the reason is like you work with cool people you like and let's do some cool work is kind of the, the MO with that. Um, so we got going, you know, <laughs> early 2020. There was only five of us to begin and uh, COVID hit, which was an absolutely terrifying thing because we all just had quit our jobs uh, to do this. So, you know, that was a big kind of hurdle to get over. Um, I'm sure it was terrifying for everybody in different ways. Um, but for us, you know, in the end, it actually worked out really good. It allowed us to kind of wrap our heads around with what, what we needed to do. And we actually found a lot of downtime to reach out to people who normally wouldn't have time to talk. So we had, you know, we've been in the industry for a very long time. We have a lot of connections around and COVID, a lot of people were just kind of down, not doing much. So we would just call friends of ours, running different studios, working at different studios, freelancing, producing on set side, client side, and just have conversations about, you know, what we wanted to do and if they had advice for us. And it actually worked out really well. We got some good connections there and um, we made it through, we made it through COVID. Um, we started with five people. We're up to 70 plus people now. Um, we don't want to be much bigger than that. Like we're, we really have a cultural feel for distillery that we care about a lot. I've worked at a lot of studios that grew very fast. You know, I'm talking 50 to 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 people. There's a cultural shift happens in the studio when you get that big. And we kind of wanted to find the sweet spot. And we all felt like around 70, 75 people is where, you know, you can build a really solid team of people. And um, the generalist work style that we do, you know, we don't do a lot of departmental stuff. We only have comp and generalists. Everybody works together like a hit squad. Um, you know, it's uh, that's really important to us. That gives us a little bit of an edge. Uh, we, we like that aspect of it. We like people that like to own their work you just get more responsibility i come from that background so does aaron and pedro um i've done big shots like with myself with a compositor and that's like a that's a crazy good feeling when you see that on the big screen or on the tv um and it's re it's rewarding and we're trying to give that opportunity to other people that work here with us um so i would i would kind of just sum up that like we're a small studio doing big things I mean, I, I liked I liked the whole explanation, even the hit squad part. But that's got to be difficult when you give somebody their dailies because what you walk up to them with a suitcase that's handcuffed to you and sunglasses on and say, "This is what you have to do today." Like, <laughs> you're like, Pretty "No much. solo, no Monday." Like this is this is how we hand over a sign. <laughs> Sounds like you've been here. Yeah, <laughs> I know, a bit of spy. So uh, okay, so. You start, you make it through COVID, you know, and you and you work on these projects. Somehow, some way, The Last of Us gets put on your radar, is in your yeah. periphery. Can you can you give us a little bit of insight on that? Sure. So this is actually really interesting because when we were just getting going, and I think there might have been our team size might have been ten to fifteen at the time. Um, I saw an article pop up that basically said that they were going to do The Last of Us as a TV show. And I saw that and I like turned around and I looked at Greg who was sitting behind me and I said, Greg, we have to get on this show somehow. Like this is like, we, we love environment work. That's our bread and butter. That's what we really are passionate about. And we just knew like we're huge fans of the game, like massive fans of the game. We were like, this is going to be a lot of environment work and it's going to be real fun. So how, how can we do this? <laughs> you know? So the oddest thing kind of happened and sometimes like the universe just kind of speaks to you in a way that you can't really explain. Um, a good friend of mine, uh, Alex Wong, who we all worked with at ILM for many years. He was my VFX supervisor for a long time. Uh, he's an amazing supervisor. Um, he 
decided to go over to the client side and join HBO. And we got a phone call one day and he wanted us to help out and join the team and get on there. And it, he provided us with an amazing opportunity to join and be part of the show. And it's one of those things that the stars just kind of align sometimes. So, you know, that was really great for us. He gave us a big opportunity because we're, like I said, we're still a new studio. We have a lot of connections. We're doing some cool stuff, but to get on a show of that magnitude um, is pretty special. That, that does also speak a little bit to uh, the culture of Nomen too. One of the things that we try and teach the students to do is like, hey, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, you, you're working on your communication skills and your networking skills because you never know when that phone call is going to come through. Never you know. know. Um, and so to, to even have a supervisor that goes and moves on, you know, if you one day talked about, you know, how much you love Jaws, just for an example, and he was <laughs> saying that, you know, the opposite – and it didn't go so great. Right, exactly. Um, yes. Yeah, but it's it's that's really good to hear that that again maintaining those connections it's super duper important. Yeah. Um, so a little you don't, tip for everyone. You don't you don't you have no idea where anyone else is going to end up ever. So, you know, be cool to everybody. That's right. So, okay, I know we're we're going to go into what you worked on on the show. Yes. But I want to go ahead and let everybody know in the chat cuz this happens all the time. We're going to have a Q&A at the end. Don't wait until the end to put your questions in, all right? You wait until the end to put your questions in. It's going to be at the bottom of the list. So go ahead and populate them. Whenever question pops in your head, whatever it is, if you want to know their favorite anime, go ahead and just put it in there. We'll put it in a list. We'll populate it over here. Um, you can just have it in the chat, and we'll populate it. Don't come at me in the end asking me why we didn't ask your question because you asked the question five minutes left in the stream. It happens all the time. So I'm letting you all know right now. All right. I'm, not, I'm not talking to you, the presenters. I'm, I'm letting. Them know. <laughs> I, know. I see very stern. It's my it's my stern voice to to let them know. See, y'all are already doing. Thank you so much, OG nice guy. I appreciate you. So, anyone else that has any questions, go ahead and put them in. And then, yeah. So, so you got to work on the show, and then um, no 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 spoilers, but you get to work on some really great episodes oh yeah and one of those episodes was uh i guess bill's town so why don't you yeah. take it away and, and, and cool um, i think uh, maybe what we could do is before i get into that maybe we could show the quick the teaser we'll show the teaser of just like leading up the, of some of the work we've done before just to get people a little bit you know get them a little excited yes i'm excited let's Awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a good way to, to sum it up. It's almost like you you all distilled it and really, really broke it down to there make you go. it its most finest form. There you, you know? go. Now now you're feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So I think um we're gonna get into Bill's town to begin, which is a very special episode to me. I'm gonna do just a little kind of brief introduction about kind of the broad strokes of that episode. And then I'm going to hand it over to uh, Aaron to kind of walk through the creative uh, technical of that. We have a nice breakdown reel we'll also show you guys. So I think um, Bill's Town was one of the bigger sequences we had on the show. Um, we did a lot of work for that episode. I would say we probably did like 90% of the stuff on that whole episode. So it was pretty unique to kind of have that much work on a single episode. We worked on a lot of episodes throughout the whole uh, series, but uh, three and seven, the mall were the big ones. Um, Bill's Town was shot on set. It's actually very small. Um, it's not that big. They they had built some kind of facades of houses uh, with a single street, uh, a couple storefronts, um, and it really needed to be flushed out. So our 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 goal from Alex and Craig was to kind of re realize that location and it it started fairly simple you know we needed to do things like uh put rooftops on houses that looked photo real um it start it started pretty basic to get going but what happened over time and that evolved was 
you know, Craig wanted a bigger sense of the town. He wanted to have a bit more of a presence to support the story. So we actually branched out and built it out a little bit bigger than they had originally intended. And I think in the end, you know, that was a really cool decision because a, it allowed us to like do a bit more creative stuff with the whole place and just try to make it more of a believable thing. Because I think the thing I'm most proud about this episode is this is my favorite style of visual effects. I've done a lot of big action, superhero, crazy CG set pieces, but to do something like this, that really is just supposed to be in the background and not draw attention. It's supposed to support a story um, that is super important. That story is incredible. Um, and I think in the end, we built a believable place that kind of just lets the story do what it needs to do. Um, and it makes the episode like very special in my opinion. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that it is, uh, it's, it's probably one of, like, again, like I like mentioned, it's definitely one of my favorite episodes on television in the past. I can't, I can't even, I can't even. Yeah. It was definitely, yeah, it, that's how I feel. Speechless. There it is. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's cool too, because as we kind of started to build Bill's town out and do a bigger thing, you know, one of the most amazing parts of the show is Craig and Alex were so on the same page. They both have a creative vision. They were really driving in the same direction. Um, and they, they gave us a lot of freedom and there was a lot of trust there to do what we needed to do. So uh, it was, it was just a really great collaboration. Yeah, and it, it was it was actually like no no slight to y'all, but I think to your point, this is this is kind of what you were going for. When when we even talked about this event and and uh one of the event coordinators came back and they were like, Oh yeah, Billstown, the, the visual effects for Billstown. I'm like, there was visual effects in there? <laughs> oh, I get I guess so. Like I didn't even think about it because you just get so immersed, you know? And sometimes you can get immersed and the visual effects will look not right. And yeah. it'll it'll take you out like that, yeah. you know. Totally, um, that didn't even happen at all. Sorry, I'm I'm ranting about how amazing you well, all you, are. You, you probably wouldn't have been immersed if there was no roofs on the houses either. Yeah, that's true. That <laughs> <have pulled you. laughs> we, we were talking about that earlier on how, how we didn't even realize that those roofs weren't real. So I <laughs> just let I'll let y'all just take take that away. Cool. Yeah. No, it, it's it's definitely um. You know, I, I got a few messages after that episode where people were asking me, like, what did you, what did you guys do? Like, I, I don't know what you guys did. And I'm like, job done. There we go. We did it. So you want to show the, 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 um, the, the video for that one first? Yeah, let's bring up the let's play the let's play the breakdown reel for everybody.
that's that's me the uh, the applauding with everyone else in the chat. Well, I'm sure is applauding. That was mind blowing. That was so. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to start talking all of a sudden. Did, did go 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 ahead? Tell us about. <laughs> I can't. I, I'm so uh, there's so much stuff that I saw that I didn't even realize. I, yeah, wow, that was amazing. Good, let give it up in the chat, everybody. Let me let me let me see those emojis coming through. That's some yeah, some serious dark magic for real. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, so go, go ahead, go ahead. All right, you got my uh, my screen up there. Yeah, sweet. All right. So this this first shot you saw this this was a really cool project to work on. Like as a generalist, uh, mostly doing environments, it's like the best case scenario is like making stuff broken and making it dirty and trying to like um, make it feel lived in. That's like it's always like things in CG usually look super clean and perfect. I started in an arch architecture, so everything had to be perfect, and it was like scratching an itch to do something like this. Um, but so like the shot like this, uh, you can see we had the plate was a, a clean, you know, manicured road had been paved recently. Um, there were some little side roads, driveways and things and some structures and stuff. And the whole idea is to make it look like it's been abandoned for years. We got cracked, cracked pavement. We've got scattered leaves. No one's cleaning this stuff up. Uh, removing any structures that were in here. This shot didn't have any, but there was a bunch of buildings and things. We'd, we'd add trees to cover them up. Um, so you can see all that, all this scatter here. Um, we'll get LIDAR scans so that we have the, the rough location or, or even photogrammetry where they give us some point clouds and we get 3D models and we, um, we have the track cameras so we can put anything that we can get in there to like blend this stuff in. And we have some help from uh, from Comp and DMP, and that's kind of forms the the hit squad. It's like the gen artist putting all this stuff in, lighting, shading their own stuff, and then uh, and then working with the Comp artist closely to get the layers we need to uh, to integrate all this stuff. But this is a pretty typical disheveling um, shot. Just adding detritus. Now here's a, a bigger scale thing. So the the plate is a drone plate. Um, you can see how small this set actually was. And initially, I think they, 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 they thought maybe they could get away with that because there was a, gr a growth to the scope of the work that included uh, stretching out these roads and adding neighborhoods. And it all, it all served the story. So their proximity, their proximity to the city and kind of what their neighborhood was like and why it was not quite so dense. You can see the fall off in density. And so we had to add a ton of, of CG trees to hide all the seams um, obviously you're not going to go in and rotoscope all the plate trees. So adding trees is much easier. So we have, um, tons of CG trees and little like home depots and, and, and structures trying to, trying to figure out like what a, a natural landscape would be. It's actually quite tricky to make something look, uh, natural as a planner would have done because you, you add too many houses all scattered and you end up looking like, um, it doesn't look like a, a like a photograph at all. So you've got to add like parking lots. Um, park cars, streets, thinking about elevation, uh, it gets pretty tricky. And then all of a sudden these, these uh, set pieces, the, we had all this stuff was modeled, every shingle was modeled by um, Mr. Jeff Tetzloff, who's not here. And uh, it all matches up to LiDAR geometry. And uh, so we, we, we know exactly where it should be in 3D space. So once we have that in the camera tracks, we can kind of sit it in there, look through the camera. And the thing about being a generalist is we're not, we're not, creating turntables of all these assets. We are putting them in place, seeing them in context and lighting them and shading them based on what we see. Uh, in this case, there's so many shots that we end up getting very close to some things. So you kind of get into the, the worst case scenario, shade for that, and then you're good for all the shots. So here's a shot, uh, another typical shot. Um, you can see they had blue screens on the tops of these buildings and, and the top of this had nothing had a roof because the structures wouldn't support it. They just built facades, um, except for the garage there. And they wanted, they wanted the road to look lived in. This is, this is an early one. This is 2003, I believe. So the, the story goes through many years over like a 20 year span. And at this point, it's kind of the beginning, but it's still uh, a level of that's already been kind of chaos uh, for a while. So you can see the the shingle addition, little greebly bits. We've got a satellite dish, 
so you can watch TV. You've got a water tower to make it feel like you're in a town, not out in the country. And then all of these trees in the back were replaced with uh, CG trees and another neighborhood going off into the distance. All the power poles they had built, they had they had anchored something in there so we could have the shadows and things, but uh, we had to extend them all and put the, uh, the actual power cables up there. And then the hookups, little things you, you wouldn't expect, like the hookups to the houses. You can see these lines coming off the power cables and hooking up correctly. Every little thing you've got to kind of research and see what they did at the time and, and for this location. And a lot of Google Maps um, street viewing to see what, what's there and what level of, of detail we need to get into. Uh, what else can I say? Leaves on the ground. Just uh, some of this is just plate augmentation. So we just had to stick leaves onto the ground to get the season right here too. And then uh, some of this stuff is, is uh, DMP. A lot of it is actually um, textures onto the LiDAR geometry and then pass to comp to, to use those. Some of them are masks and they can just use them to contrast the plate and do some, some really cool, um, it, it, it really sticks and it feels photographic. This is uh, an example of uh, some of the years we had to go through. So we had to, to shade and model these for different levels of, uh, of detritus over the, over the course of the story. So it starts in 2003, which is, is it's still post, it's still post-apocalyptic, but it's just fresh. Um, and you can see 2010, we've got some more uh, where uh, things are kind of starting to get dingy and moldy. We've got some mold growth here and um, the roads getting dirtier, the driveway. And then 2023, it's, you kind of get some peeling paint and up here you get some rot and all this kind of thing. It's like, it's like telling a story. It's kind of like the set is a character and you don't notice it because in the story, you kind of have an idea of how much time has passed because you're watching the characters and you're seeing them age and, and things. But the, the set supports that in a way that um, is a bit subliminal, but you can tell stories with this. Like, you, like just this little bit here, you can see rain has been hitting this and splashing and keeping that damp and then getting dirty and they don't want to climb on the roof and clean it all the time like you would. Um, and so it ends up rotting out. And even though Bill's very on top of his, his property and it looks better than the rest of the houses, um, which is something you have to consider, this house doesn't quite deteriorate as fast as the other ones, um, it still starts to show its age. Here's another example of a bit of an advanced age. You can see the, the mold growth, the curling uh, shingles, the paint chipping, the rusting of the metal bits. And you can see this had no roof. So we've got like little antennas and, and stacks and vents and power hookups. And then this kind of thing, there's a, you can see like there's a tree here, a fine tree over top of the plate and we had to get a roof behind that tree. So in a case like that, we actually had, um, I, I believe it was a DMP artist extracted what they could of the tree and then recreated what was left and then put that on a card in, in Nuke in 2D and could overlay it back on top. So we didn't have to worry about uh, trying to get a perfect uh, roto or anything off this to focus tree in the plate. It ended up working out pretty good. Uh, also these, uh, these, these chain link fences we had we had to add all these vines and you could see some, a lot of them were animated um, with breeze and they would sit on these fine little wires. And so we had to have this, this fence modeled and, and then dressed on all this stuff. And then the shadows and everything, it lines up pretty good. It, it's, a, it's a kind of a tedious little um, photo modeling job, but we extended the fence all over the place too and added fences where there weren't any. And on the ground, you can see the additional um, leaves and things. It's, it's subtle, but because there, there was some in the plate, they had dressed some in, but there's, for example, none on this side of the wall. So we wanted actually more here. So uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a fun task when, you're, when you have reference or you have plate that you're trying to match versus making something completely fantastical and, and, uh, and new because you have this great kind of resource for matching and lighting. Um, matching the lighting because we had lidar of all this stuff you could you could sit there with the lidar and and you could overlay it with the plate and just move the sunlight around until the shadow lined up perfectly and once you have that you knew your sun angle was perfect and it, it helps a ton for getting the stuff to sit in this part of the roof 
So um, there's just walking through. So this is the original plate, um, same deal. There's a couple design choices, like um, we added some, some roof here in, in the model and there's a, a bit of, when you, when you put a perfectly square roof in, it ends up looking a bit weird. Um, so we ended up putting a bit of curvature to the rooftops. You can barely see it here, but you notice when it's not there and it just adds that much more because houses are never perfect. The framing always has a bit of uh, uh, kind of like peeking at the, at the corners there. The, let's see, we've got vines growing and everything. So the vines were another thing. We were growing vines on stuff and uh, throughout the, the years, we get more and more vines growing and uh, it becomes a bit of a chore to keep track of, of what year gets what but we had like one singular um, scene file. This was 3D Studio Max and V-Ray um, to do the final renders. And we would, we would, we had it set up in a way that if you, if you launched a render for a certain shot, it would automatically pick the correct look dev and geo and, and lighting for the shot. And then this guy was just a house that was completely not in the plate. They just wanted to, to add to the neighborhood. So uh, another couple examples. So this, this area is this is the same location, but just looking the reverse directions of them approaching the gate. Um, this was a, a structure they had covered up. They didn't want it in the in the shot, and that gave us a better key uh, to to extract this fence to put something behind it. And originally they just wanted to put um, I think just forest back here, but then later when we when we decided we needed more more um, neighborhood. To, to tell the story that this is kind of a, a small section of a neighborhood with more um, beyond the, the outskirts there. We put in all this stuff. So we put in more trees, more houses to give you the feeling that you're in, you're still in an urban center, um, the suburbs. And you can see all the vines that got put in for this. This is the 2023 year. And the church is pretty destroyed at this point. All the shingles curling. There's the, I could not walk through a neighborhood while working on the show and not stare at everybody's roofs. There was, there was times when I'm sure people were looking out their window and just wondering why I was standing outside their house, staring at their roof, but they have like the perfect amount of mold or the perfect amount of shingle curling. And, uh, it, there's, I was constantly taking photos with my iPhone. And then these, um, yeah, the, the power poles. It really adds a lot to have little little things like that hanging in, in screen like that. So this is the the I think it was the final shot in the in the in the sequ in this um, show, and it's pretty cool. It's it, it was more like really low sunlight, so you get these these nice um, kind of uh, uh, red like uh, golden hour sunlight coming through. And they wanted to show this truck driving off in the distance, but the road you can see just goes across here. So they would have just driven past camera and be gone, but they wanted to have that lingering in there. So we ended up bending the road and changing the trees and, and making it kind of go off into distance. We could watch the truck take off as the camera pan, uh, kind of uh, trucks back. And uh, this one has a lot of uh, disheveling. This, this, this tree we swapped for, uh, for a full CG tree. A couple of them, we did that. It just helped with integration and, and sometimes the, the dead trees they wanted to kind of fill up with leaves anyway. And then this is a really good example of the vine growth. There would have been multiple versions of this, but um, they would they would slowly creep higher and higher up the building and there's some holes in the structure. That was a fun one. Cool. I think I'll just add to that last shot through the window is like one of my favorite shots of the episode. Like for fans of the game, they'll know like the original game, the menu is that shot out the window. And that's definitely like a spiritual uh, nod to that, which was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that again, <laughs> there's a, there's a lot of things that, that just seeing that uh, so much stuff, is so impressive so first and foremost the visual effects but also kudos to the actors i don't know how i could walk out and stay in character and turn around and see a roofless building and not be distracted you know um 
but I mean, even adding the other buildings in there that weren't there, a lot of that stuff was crazy seamless. It, it I mean, that was, uh, yeah, very, very impressive. I know you all do this professionally. I get it, okay? But still, <laughs> it's still very, very impressive to me. I'm sure that a lot of people in the chat feel the same. I do want to reach out to the chat for a second and thank you all. You're all putting in your questions now. I got them all here. I'm logging them. There's some really, really great questions. Um, but just as an aside, before we continue on, because you're kind of already talking about it a little bit, so we'll, we'll kind of carry on with it. Uh, a lot of people were curious about the programs that you were using for this. So you did mention Nuke. You mentioned 3D Studio Max. You mentioned V-Ray. Um, yeah. Is there anything else where it's like, man, we wouldn't have been able to get it done if it weren't for this? Uh, yeah, I mean, when we're making our scatters, we generally go into something like Speed Tree to uh, to create some animation, um, like create a tree. You know, get the species right. You can kind of you can you can research what species are in an area, and then you can start from like a library tree or just try to create it from scratch and 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 look at the ref that way um that one's really handy um we do a lot of uh layout and animation in maya and a lot of modeling um some of some guys will model in either max or maya just whatever you're comfortable with but it's all part of the pipeline um uh, so we got i mean obviously photoshop um Obviously, Photoshop got to be. Yeah. Oh, so so what you're saying is that uh, most of the background that you use, you just use the predictive fill, and then that, that <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's it's all AI. Yeah, yeah we didn't yeah. do anything actually. <laughs> click click click, and then you're all done. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, okay, so that 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 was amazing. I, I, I'm sorry I keep interrupting. I'm just I, I didn't expect to be so mind blown throughout this. It's very this is a very fun watch for me. So then, continuing on. Uh, okay, to go to the so, mall. Yeah, let's see. Uh, the mall. Yeah. The yeah. Mall. So maybe I'll just talk about the mall a little bit before we get going, and Pedro will uh, do the same sort of kind of walkthrough. We'll also look at a breakdown reel of that. Um, the mall was a, a slightly different style uh, thing that we had to do. It was one of the only full CG environments we had on the show. That's com a complete replacement. Um, it was filmed in a one floor mall in Calgary, uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada, um, which is one of our uh, neighboring uh, provinces over here in BC. But um, the interesting thing about it is I have a couple cool stories about this is one is I don't know if anyone followed some of Craig's podcasts where he would talk about some of this stuff, but the mall was actually, it was a one story real place. It was actually uh, closed up. So they were going to destroy it. So when the set crew got there, they got this brilliant setup of like the people that owned it were like, you can go in there and do whatever you want because we're going to destroy it. So they basically could just mess it up as much as they wanted, knowing that it was never going to be seen again. So, um, that was pretty interesting. The problem with it was is that Ellie's journey to go see this mall is is a is a big story event. It's she's never seen this in her whole life. She's she's been growing up in quarantine the entire time. So a mall to her is something that she's never seen with her own eyes. So Alex and Craig were both telling us like how important this was that this had to be a much bigger, expansive, wondrous place. It needed to be at least two stories with big ceilings. Um, and we just didn't have that in the real practical uh, set mall. So there were shots that are literally just straight on blue screens. It's just Bella Ramsey standing in front of a guardrail. And there's a giant blue screen with some set lights. And our job was to basically put a full photo reel model of a mall behind her, um, which is, you know, we've been doing this kind of work for a long time but it's always intimidating to have to do something full CG that's locked off. The camera's like locked off. There's no motion blur to hide behind. There's nothing, camera's not moving around. So you have to really cross a bar with the quality of work that you're doing there. Um, so for us, you know, we were going after references, um, really looking at photography of like malls from the eighties and nineties to try to kind of capture that feel of like what a wondrous old school mall would look like. Um, 
our asset supervisor, Jeff Tetzlov. This is one of the funny stories. You know, he built a lot of the mall models that you'll see in here. Um, the mall they filmed in was actually his childhood mall. So he, oddly enough, spent a lot of time when he was younger inside that mall. So it was kind of like this, uh, again, sometimes the universe speaks out to you. So Jeff was kind of like working on this really cool episode with his own childhood mall, making it even cooler. Um, and that's ended up what going into the show. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of this work. I think it's like some, some of our best work on the show. Um, again, we got a lot of, we got a lot of really good feedback about it. I think, uh, for us, like it's definitely, it feels like a wondrous moment when they turn the lights on in the mall. Dude, so real, real quick, you said it, it was his, his childhood mall, meaning the one that they were going to tear down or the one that y'all yes. designed? The, the one, the one, one, the one that they actually filmed on because there, you'll see some shots in the breakdown where they're on the, they're on the bottom floor yeah. and that's a real mall. And we had to extend up onto the second floor. Um, and we have shots of her up on the second floor looking at everything. But that mall you see downstairs is a real place uh, that our asset supervisor used to spend a lot of time in. That's <laughs> wild. That's wild. Yeah. That is a full circle moment. As exactly. Yeah. So without further ado, let's go to the mall. Let's go to the mall. Back, uh, brings back a lot of painful memories. I mean, wondrous memories. Wondrous. <laughs> <laughs> really good job, y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so I guess I'll talk a little bit about them all. Um, so, well, first and foremost, I was, as a lot of people uh, working on this show, and not only at the distillery, but in other studios, this was sort of a passion project in a way. There's a lot of people that like myself, played the game when it first came out and uh, were in love with the story, this world that was created. Um, it has some fantastic characters in it and the stories and what brought them to where they are today. Um, and I think I feel very proud and very that we, we had a great opportunity at the Distillery to work in some of these moments that were so um, important uh, for the characters. Uh, also some beautiful environments, which as John said, is a lot of our background over here. Um, a lot of uh, the people working at Distillery um, have worked in uh, generalist environment roles for a long time. So doing this sort of work is what we kind of live for in our in our work, uh, work days. Um, so for them all, um, our, as John uh, mentioned briefly, uh, we, it was all about creating these these environments that or help uh, adding to these environments uh, in which Ellie for the first time would see this this world that no longer exists uh, was it has to be wondrous it has to be uh, colorful playful um, it has to kind of transport the viewer into this happy place this um, childhood nostalgia which as John said uh, rang very true to, for Jeff uh, who actually grew up in this mall so except the blue ceiling I don't think he was blue when he was a kid uh, running around in this <laughs> in this level but um, 
what what did happen, as John mentioned, is that when they they got hold of this location, they were able to do a lot of this set dressing and uh, set the mood for what this would be, which is key uh, in an environment like this because not only it sets uh, the the mood in terms of lighting, in terms of the amount of weathering, the uh, how, how abandoned it really feels. It also gives a setting for the actors to really bounce off of uh, and just perform in this, in this environment. But uh, the challenge that uh, when Alex uh, talked to us about this environment, the challenge was really that it didn't feel big enough. Like you had to feel bigger, you had to feel that there was more to, to this environment than, uh, than this, this one floor, uh, more to get lost on, more to, to kind of explore. Um, so we had to, to our first task, and there's two distinctive tasks I'm gonna talk about today, but uh, one of them was starting with these plates that we had and extend it up. Um, so we started uh, on, on this instance here by uh, kind of starting from, from a LiDAR of the real location, kind of working out how it had to be. Um, Jeff, along with Jonas, kind of blocked out some of the, the modeling, the models, and it's kind of the, the rough layout of how this would look like, how big, are, how tall are the ceilings, how many floors, where does it break, bridges, how do we hide where the plate is going to eventually connect to this. Like very, very early on, these were the kind of problems we had to solve. Um, we had like uh, these overhangs that were kind of covering too much, especially from the top that we had to shorten to keep like the width uh, uh, big enough that we could see upstairs a little bit and get a little hint of all these shops. Again, the VFX on this work was not so much to take center action. Like a lot of work uh, that we do, um, you know, the VFX is right on your face. It's, it's part of the telling the stories like right in front of the camera. In projects like this, it's really about helping uh, world building about uh, setting setting the mood and kind of play background to to a beautiful story. Um, so we try to keep it as seamless, like the materials working together, uh, embed into what was created originally, and in certain instances add to it a little bit uh, and have things coming from the top down, um, kind of help blending it all together. Uh, the mall also finished at the Best Buy down there, which was uh, for, for a while, it looked like a blue screen to us that we thought we had to remove, but now it's actually a shop that had to stay that way. <laughs> it looks like a forgotten uh, blue screen, which is not. Um, but above that, there's a whole other level, and the, the mall, the actual real mall, was not long enough uh, to tell this story, especially on the shots I'm going to discuss in a little bit. Uh, so we actually had to grab the real mall and make two more uh, two more sections that long to, to make it look that big. Um, yeah, so a lot of the, our work on this was kind of modeling it all, uh, texture it, look, they have a lot of procedural techniques to kind of shade and texture all of this. Um, uh, vine growing, we grow some vines on location uh, using softwares like Speedtree uh, to actually grow them in place. Uh, other vines were like little kit vines that we built that were just kind of placed by hand or scattered uh, where, where it made sense. Uh, to really can add to these kind of overgrown sort of sort of feel, uh, and then we added all these extra little bits of like atmosphere and things in in comp. There were some volumetric renders as well we did for this, but uh, a lot of those kind of final little uh, touches were done through elements in comp. Um, yeah, it was a pretty cool, fun fun environment for us. Um, here's another uh, example of of another shot in the same environment. Also, like. I should say that this environment actually exists as a one set piece. So it's a whole big environment uh, expanded from this LiDAR and it all exists as one, one location. Um, there is one area of this mall, which is going to be a little bit of a kind of quirk for you guys to figure out, that is not actually continuous. It, there's only one part of this whole mall that actually in some shots is one way and in other shots is different for a very specific reason but I'll let you try to figure that one out. Um, yeah, so this is kind of looking the other direction. Um, and I'll go a little bit more into the technicalities on when we're upstairs, but uh, yeah, it's kind of our, our extension here. We had uh, been provided some, uh, the client had done quite a lot of uh, preparation for actually dressing the shops downstairs. So they already had some, some shops and some brands they wanted to use. Uh, there's others that we had to create ourselves, come up with some shop 
uh, names and logos and colors. Again, like cleaning a little bit what had done on, had been done on set, uh, but also adding some extra to kind of add some some kind of fill lights that would come from the top floors into some of the bottom floors. So we actually added some some lighting, some additional lighting. As you can see here, there's some kind of purpley lights and uh, warm lights just on near the plate and on the plate a little bit just to help connect the two to try to make the as seamless as possible so we we took over the plate where where we needed to but we left as much as the plate as we could uh, and then there's other areas where there were vines that were put on set that actually made it a little tricky because uh the the real location had all these pillars uh kind of going across uh from one side to the other like in 10 meter increments or so uh, and actually we wanted to extend the mob, we wanted to see it. So we wanted to be able to look up and see the roofs, the ceilings, the, all these colors, all these logos, all these uh, uh, these details upstairs. Uh, but once we had these pillars, that actually didn't work. But originally when they were on set, they thought that we would keep the pillars, so they dressed them with vines. And when we got down to it, we were like, all right, these pillars need to go. And now there's floating vines in the middle of the mall. So we had to find like, ingenious techniques to kind of hide those. One of them was actually lean, like breaking one of the light poles here in the background, uh, having it leaning and adding our own CG vines on it that we could just have vines from the plate blending with CG vines and not have to fully reconstruct the background in a bunch of shots. Because um, that's another thing that uh, we had to have into consideration is that we had a lot of shots where we had to put our extension uh, that if we were committed to remove something in the plate, we'd have to remove across a bunch of shots. So instead of fully removing uh, in one shot and then having to do it in a bunch of others, we just find ways to try to hide it and to try to work with it and around these sort of these sort of problems. Um, yeah, so a lot of our work at this level was uh, leaning in on 3D uh, techniques uh, to kind of build these environments. Uh, we had other shots uh, that we saw in the breakdown where we were able to use photography and just straight on the MP, like certain extensions. Um, but yeah, this is kind of the the result of of what what we did. Uh, it was all a lot of it, a lot of the the challenge here. Uh, obviously, there was kind of a shading, texturing challenge, but and layout, like really kind of making this this believable. But the big challenge was lighting. Really, there's hundreds thousands of lights here that we had to to create in cg and we had to make them look believable a lot of that was through procedural techniques like we had lights varying in slight u shifts in a, a value this is an old mall a lot of these lights don't work anymore or are very old um, so we had to kind of uh, really uh, make them vary a little bit. And uh, again, some of that was by hand. So we by hand decided where we wanted to put some um, effort uh, and time to actually dress it exactly how we wanted. Uh, a lot of it was uh, procedural, uh, just leaning on procedural techniques to kind of vary and randomize things. Um, Cool. So uh, that's kind of uh, the shots, the group of shots that uh, landed themselves to like an extension, but uh, following up from plate. Then uh, the other part of this work uh, was upstairs. So obviously, as uh, I mentioned, uh, the downstairs was a relocation. When they had this first moment, and for the ones of you that have played the game, it's very iconic when Ellie first gets to the mall and there's this moment where the lights come on. When uh, uh, the lights are turned on, she has this kind of, this first view of, of this moment. For for Craig and Neil, this was very important. Like this was, I'd say, the first thing that came with the brief of this work was, this has to look great, it has to look photoreal. This has to uh, bring the viewers into this magical moment, leave this with Ellie, how important this is, because this is setting up the third act of this episode and is like the, the really heading complexity and depth to Ellie's personality, character development, and the Ellie that we're gonna uh, follow the, this journey uh, with till the end of the series. Um, so it was very important that this moment kind of struck home. But they had this challenge where in the real location, they couldn't actually get physically get a camera high enough to film it and to keep the downstairs off the mall. So the solution was um, to go into a stage, uh, build a railing and put some lights in and a boom mic like you can see here. 
and just have a blue screen and uh, deal with it in CG. Um, if you've listened to the podcast that John was mentioning earlier, um, Craig and Alex, well, Craig brought this news to Alex and Alex was a bit nervous, apparently. I wasn't there, but from, from the podcast and from the chats with Alex about how this was going to get shot and what had to be done in CG because it's it's kind of difficult to ground things in reality when you have a lot of blue screen. And that's why you see a lot of directors uh, trying to shoot as much as they can, even if we end up replacing it. I've worked in projects in the past where they shot a play and then the final shot is full CG. But uh, it, like having something to work from is going to help guide what, what that's going to look like. And luckily, we did have the downstairs, which uh, obviously we leaned on. But... Uh, um, for these shots upstairs, there was a lot of figuring it out. So this is a lot of where, where we started, actually. We started upstairs, uh, blocking the, the shape of the mall, blocking the walls, uh, really figuring out layout-wise what this would look like. Uh, and once we started getting, like there was a lot of like back and forth, or not a lot, but there was some back and forth with Alex trying to figure out, okay, we need this wider, we need to see downstairs, we need this longer, we need two more uh, depths, we need to, like we need a cross uh, section so the mall looks like it goes into other areas. Um, so there was some design uh, stage there. And for that stage, it was all kind of rough. We grabbed the LiDAR, just built some boxes, kind of modeled it, like just put some details. And every version we showed, we'd show some reference and we would detail that a little bit more. And once we started getting to a point where we felt that uh, Alex was feeling that we were in the right track, then we'd start really cramming in detail and start building some of the shops and some of the roofs and ceilings and all, all these details. Um, and uh, um, and after that, the dressing, which I'll get into in a, in a moment. Um, but the next stage of this was actually uh, the lighting. And I'm going to show you the plate first so you have an idea of what we're kind of talking about. So when they envisioned this, they had this idea about what they wanted the, the lights to do. Uh, and this is what we, we started from. So we had Ellie standing in front of the, uh, the this big blue screen with some lights coming on that were supposed to represent shops turning on. And obviously, straight away looking here, there's some challenges where these lights are on screen. Uh, and for these lights to stay on screen and to, to be uh, to be here means that we'd have to, in CG, actually place lights there that from, from light sources from shops that would actually be around the same place. Um, and we decided very, very early on that we were not going to be able to have lights without making some design compromises that we thought would not um, be flattering for the design of the mall, we decided that we would lose those lights. And to lose those lights, we had to lose the railings. So we straight away decided that we were going to pitch an idea where we would lose just keep Ellie, essentially, lose everything else. Um, and at this moment, I'm actually going to like just go back to something that John said earlier, where you know we work in a lot of projects. And sometimes one of the biggest challenges we face is with um, like really understanding what the client wants. And sometimes there's concept art, there's previous, there's things that help us get there. Um, but sometimes the clients are not quite there with their idea for them, something to, to, to look and we kind of figure that out with them as we go. In this instance, actually, uh, Alex was so in tune with what Craig and Neil wanted um, they're obviously also working on an IP that is very well defined, but in situations like this, we're redesigning an environment from, from scratch. Um, but they were so in tune to what the story had to do, to what the edit had to do, to what the location needs need, needed to feel like, not necessarily look like, but feel like, um, that we got like a really good uh, guidance from Alex on what we we're going to achieve. And then Luckily, to do to the relationships we already had with Alex, uh, our conversations were very upfront, were very uh, open, and we it was very collaborative. We had an opportunity in this project, which is amazing when it happens, that to be very collaborative with Alex and to kind of really try to figure out where we were heading. Um, so when we did this, uh, so I'm going to show you like a kind of a grayscale version of of this this environment. So when we kind of build this, it's already very detailed. This is the final mall. Um, as as we used to render, uh, when we got to this, and uh, we actually never we didn't show this level of detail to Alex at, at, at this stage. So we actually show some blo blockings earlier. The next time we showed this to Alex, we actually showed him a version of the mall that was seventy percent textured, looked dev, uh, that had uh, the key for the foreground, 
the element was in, and we did the first blocking of the animation of the lights. Um, and we kind of leaned on the conversations we had. There are some previews that showed roughly, uh, previews that was actually done by someone that now works with us uh, here, Anson. Um, and we actually had some good guidance on what to pursue and what they liked about that, what they didn't. Uh, so we pitched an idea of what the light animation should be and what what like this environment should look like. So when we took this version to, to well, this is the final comp version. So it wasn't as polished as this. The first version we showed to Alex was actually a gen slap uh, with some animated lights. We pitched it to Alex. We were in a meeting with him, John and myself, and we were talking about. We had a list of things we wanted to work on. Alex had a list of things he wanted us to work on, and John as well. And we were all kind of collaborating together. Oh, you'd be cool to do this, you'd be cool to do that. The animation of the lights, we could try this, try that, all these ideas. And it was so collaborative that we were all excited. Like, it wasn't like we're getting these notes and we're like, oh, God, there's another three months of work here. And we were actually all pitching in with these ideas and what we wanted to do because we we're all passionate about this, this project and this sequence. Um, and Alex took uh, was happy with the progress we had done, and he really wanted to show it to Craig. So he took our GenSlab version one uh, to uh, to Craig, and Craig loved it. He was like, "I love this." So Alex talked with him about the notes we had, and Alex and Craig was like, "Don't change the lights. We, I like the animation. This feels exactly what I wanted to feel. Feel free to polish it, but don't change it too much." which is a great thing that rarely, rarely happens. Uh, I can count on the fingers of my one hand how many times you have a first version that like, feels like it's so close to then, uh, but really just a testament to how in tune and how good this working relationship was um, and how much how in sync we were. Um, and it was from then on, we could spend the rest of the time just adding detail and polishing and focusing on other things. Um, and we kind of had a framing of what that shot was going to look like in the series. Uh, and with that shot came all the other shots around it. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some technicalities on how we achieve some of this work. Uh, so as I said before, like the upstairs was all modeled. So as you can see here, it's all modeled to detail. A lot of the texture and shading is done procedurally. Uh, we leaned on a lot of like tree planners and procedural dirt techniques and uh, noise masks and all these kind of good techniques to get us like coverage of the whole thing real, real quick. Um, and then started adding some kind of decals and some little bits like by hand. Same with dressing, there was some stuff that was kind of procedurally scattered. Um, and then there was stuff that was placed by hand to really design and like make decisions of where all these things would be uh, to really like get to this final frame. Same with the vines. We had some stuff that was grown procedurally, but we also had a lot of vines out under my hand. Uh, I, I love procedural techniques and I love to let like uh, uh, the computer do a lot of that heavy lifting for us and really just focus on a final image. Uh, but at the same time, sometimes there's nothing like just grabbing a few polygons by hand and moving them. So it was uh, like a really mixed sort of technique. Um, then for the lights, as I said before, there was a lot of like emissive light, uh, emissive maps and uh, some mesh lights. There was a lot of uh, unique lights placed by hand, but scattered. Uh, we had to then separate everything into uh, their own PLO. So every every group of lights would have would be in their own pass. Um, we had to also go after some light path expressions to isolate the different components of the light so that we had full flexibility in compositing to uh, then animate these lights. So, and that's what we did. So we were able, once we finished the setup of the scene, we rendered it, we brought those renders into Nuke and we had full control of every single or every group of light and the contribution of that light specular, the refraction, the uh, volumes, and all of that, we uh, comped it additively. And we just, uh, we had like different, on our setup, we have different IDs for each light that we could just animate, turn on, turn off, and it would take everything that would be, uh, that would come with that light. That also enables us to deal with things like noises and other things. Um, so, yeah. Um, we did the first kind of pass of this in gen and then ended over to uh, Ben in comp that uh, kind of polished the, the, the animation, the timings. We did a lot of like research onto how some of these lights, halogen bulbs, how do they turn on and off and uh, fluorescent lights and like how all these different lights behave and really try to bring some of those moments. We don't want to, didn't want it to be overwhelming. We didn't want the eye, the eye of the audience to just go to one specific light. We wanted 
we wanted you to look at this shot the same way Ellie would. Like you look around, you're looking at everything and not just fixated in one specific uh, place. Um, so that's kind of what we try to do, make it believable and kind of try to have the viewer just taking it all in. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the downstairs because that was a different fun challenge. So obviously, as we discussed on the previous, I'm just going to go back a few frames here just to show you. Uh, there was this set that was built. Uh, now we were upstairs. There was no photography because, as you could see here, there's no way that it could have gone anywhere upstairs to shoot the angle downstairs we needed. Uh, and they didn't also know exactly where that camera would have had to be. Uh, so what we got was, we call it Panosphere. So it's like 360 pictures of the mall from different vantage points in the middle of this, this corridor. Um, and then we use those to actually recreate the downstairs for that shot. So, and the way we did that is we modeled that the model for the downstairs, as you can see, is very basic. It's kind of some cubes and some shapes and some planes. It's very simple. Um, and we aligned every single one of those panospheres to the LiDAR. And then uh, in Nuke, we reprojected those panospheres into that uh, proxy geometry, which is a technique we've We've used a few times uh, with great success um, to kind of recreate the downstairs. Obviously, if you're familiar with kind of DMP and projection techniques, uh, this introduces other issues where some areas are going to be stretched, some areas are going to like smearing, are going to be duplicating the echo. So there's a pillar that's going to show on the geometry behind it and so on. So there's a, a little bit of fixing there, but it works surprisingly well. We actually got the first version we showed to, to Alex was uh, with a first pass of that with no paint, no additional pixels, pixels changed. It was just a raw projection and it was kind of believable already, uh, which was great. So what you're seeing downstairs is that, that photography reprojected. And then we had uh, one of our generalists, Matt Painters kind of jumping in, uh, Veronica, to kind of go and uh, add some additional painting to kind of just tidy up and uh, also change it a little bit because one thing that actually happened is when you're downstairs it looks very busy and it looks like there's lots of paper and vines and all these things but actually when you're downstairs looking down it looks very empty uh, even though we're using the photography in the real location from that vantage point it didn't look half as busy and weathered so in the mp we added more paper more like little bits more weathering uh, we fixed some of the shops um, and yeah we recreated the downstairs and you know hopefully to a level where most viewers will have not noticed that this was not shot in the real location. That was our goal. Uh, replacing the foreground glass also enabled us to just break one of the panes and also have the lights as we turn the lights on. And I'll show you the shot again in a second. And you'll be able to notice that the whole glass, all the surfaces actually interact with that light, which is great. And all we had to do, is, well, all we had to do, I uh, don't want to make it sound too simple, but we had to try to really time those lights to the what you see on the plate of Ellie. So she will have certain highlights, like from different angles, kind of lighting her up. And we had to time that to some of our lights to kind of uh, justify and not make her look cut out, not make her look that she's not there. Uh, and that was really the key. So after we have an environment that is believable, is really bring her into that environment and make sure that what we're doing just ties everything all together. There was obviously quite a lot of comping to also adjust levels and colors and just kind of like massage things into place. But I'd say that the CG was pretty successful. Uh, what was rendered for these shots was, uh, was pretty close to, to what you're seeing here. Uh, which is great. Um, one more advantage I'm just going to mention for downstairs is doing these projection techniques. So the I'm not going to go into too deep of technical uh, details here, but uh, reprojecting these panos that were bracketed images enabled us to get HDRIs for the signs. So what you're seeing downstairs are that this pink shop, for example, that has the lights on and this gap sign and this uh, spirit sign. Those signs uh, we had. HDRI textures for them. So we had that in lights that were actually lighting the upstairs. So not only we had, we tried to mimic some lights from uh, upstairs, downstairs, we also used the, all the downstairs environment to light the upstairs environment. And when we're turning those light on, all of those lights downstairs, even though they're based on photography, they also have their own IDs, their own uh, PLOs, that we could then in comp also turn on and turn the contribution of that light. So when that story is coming on downstairs, the upstairs is getting the influence of that light. And that just, it was an extra layer to really make it look like it's a whole one environment and it's it's believable. Um, yeah, 
Uh, we, I'll touch softwares a little bit. Obviously, as Aaron mentioned before, we're uh, in Max and V-Ray for the look dev and uh, rendering. We use Speedtree, Photoshop, um, Maya for a lot of the layout. That's another thing we had to do, like lay out all these cameras, move them around. There were some additional tweaks and creative moves we, we did for like little adjustments. Um, we used Houdini for some, uh, some of the procedural uh, things we did for some of the models and some of the scatters. Um, yeah, and a lot of Nuke, a lot of like Nuke adjusting, bringing everything together on the final animation. Um, yeah, and that's it. I'm going to show you the shot again here. And this is the, the final shot of the mall coming to life. I'll play it once again. Awesome. I hope that was informative and you got a little glimpse at uh, the work that our team did uh, on this environment. Um, yeah, any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Oh, there are questions. <laughs> there, are, there are many questions. I, I, I do want to say to the chat, okay, wait, first and foremost, let's uh, another, another round of applause. Uh, you know, I know we only have emotes in here, but the love is real. That was phenomenal. Once again, it's it's so uh, the the only word that comes to mind is strange because because I watch it and my brain didn't even tell me that what I was looking at wasn't real until I watched that breakdown. Even even seeing Ellie in front of the railing, I was like, oh, okay, the railing it's in front of a blue screen, so they just knocked out the blue screen, and then you're like. No, no, no. <laughs> it actually <laughs> knocked out everything. <laughs> it's like, we're not even going to use any of that. We're just going to keep Ellie and we're just going to do it all. And the fact that that is the case and it looked as good as it did. Again, I understand you're professionals. This is what you all do. But there are professionals out there that, again, you know, they don't they don't follow those same parameters. They don't I don't know. They just don't uh, distill it. If you would, <laughs> nice. I do like that word. I like yeah, this. I you've got way. it. You've got it now. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah some, okay, so. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. I was just going to add on that. Sometimes we just have to, independently of the brief or uh, the challenges that I put in front of you, we have to, as early as possible, making decisions that will yeah. get us there and that will get the best result. Because ultimately, in collaboration with the clients, we just want to make the best looking work possible, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and, and like you had alluded to as well, you know, there, there is always that dichotomy of like, okay, I want to make the best work, but also what the client wants, right? If the client, if you would just come out with, you know, all those shapes, like you were talking about, and they were like, that's perfect. Well, then technically you did your job, right? But the fact that there was this synergy that you had, right, that, that you had the vision and it kind of synced up uh, is, is really phenomenal. I do have to ask because I ask this all the time. So I'm very curious before we get into all the Q&A stuff. Obviously, when you're working on these, right there, it, you know, you were you were mentioning speed treats. It, it, it was a little bit different, but you did say there were certain things you did by hand for that ticky tacky stuff. That's what I like to call it. Ticky tacky. When you're kind of in a groove and for eight hours that day, you know, you're going to be working on one thing. It's a little repetitive. You're kind of grinding in it. Right. You're just really working it out. Um, workflow wise to keep you centered are you listening to music are you listening to a podcast are you listening to <laughs> some people say they they do um noise canceling headphones right no no sound no nothing some people are all podcasts so they have to hear talking and some people are all music no talking at all so i'm curious out of the three uh, how does how does that go for you on, on, on that I, I mean i'm a big immersion junkie so you know, I wasn't doing shot work on this show. Like I'm an I'm an environment artist as well. I did that for a long time, but I was supervising this show. Um, so I was reviewing a lot of shots, looking at work, uh, talking to Alex all the time. Um, I had The Last of Us soundtrack going pretty much all the time. I wanted to be right in the zone when I'm looking at that stuff, you know, because um, the music the music also is like just absolutely phenomenal. So it's the it's the it's kind of the whole thing you know it's like the it's like the performance from all the actors and actresses on that show um the visuals and then the music when that when those things all come together it's pretty magic so i like to stay in the zone i listen to music yeah, yeah. i oh sorry go on Aaron. 
Oh, I agree with that. Like, I think that anything that puts you in in the state of mind that you want to be in to create the mood, especially if you're doing lighting or, or something that's really affecting the, the look. Um, but doing a lot of really small um, detail work that can be tedious at times. Um, if I listen to a podcast, I wouldn't hear a word. I'm just totally, you know, one track. <laughs> yeah, I think it it goes with the type of work. I've definitely in the past when when I spend more time in the in the box than these days, I I had times where I was able to listen to some podcasts because the work was a little bit more repetitive and you kind of you can pay a little bit more attention. But more often than not, I I'd followed like John's similar to John where you kind of try to put something that will like put you in the mood and sometimes is something really hard <laughs> sometimes <laughs> you just need to to get through it um but that's actually something i love about uh these and any of us here will be very passionate to talk about generalism uh but i, I love about the sort of work we do uh, and environments work because you know we're always thinking about the final image the final pixels like what this is going to look like on screen and there's a lot of steps around, uh, to get there that are not as enjoyable as others. There's a lot of things that, you know, you kind of, and it depends on the person. There's people that are going to love certain things. So there's going to be someone in that chat that I'm going to say, like when I'm UVing, I find that very boring. There's going to be someone that loves UVing. Like, so it's, it's really, it really varies depending on who, who's doing the work. But there's definitely aspects of the work we do that I enjoy less. But because I'm always thinking about the final goal, the whole process is enjoyable. Um, yeah. I could go awesome. on about journalists for, for an hour. <laughs> this is a general question that I, that I like to ask because every answer is so wildly different. And it didn't even occur to me that that was going to, I thought everybody listened to, you know, Studio Ghibli soundtracks because that's what I do when I get tucked in, you know, um, but that's not the case. Everyone's listening to different things. Okay. So chat, I just want, I, I'm going to let you know right now. If you have more questions, now's the time to put them in. But I also want to congratulate y'all because this is the first time that I've ever seen two pages worth of questions. So we have some questions, uh, and we're gonna we're gonna start running through them. A lot of people are really curious, um, but I think we'll start with the biggest question that seems to kind of uh, permeate the chat right now, which is uh, breaking in. Right. So you so you were talking about that you were kind of in the industry, uh, all of you before you were working at ILM or, or different studios. And then you decided, obviously, to start out on your own uh, and then breaking in. We talked about a little bit of networking, but do you have any advice for anybody else that's trying to get into the industry, what they should do? Is there anything that you wish that you knew before you broke in? I mean, I think the greatest thing that I can say about this is like, it's just a different time and place now for students coming out of school. Now there's so many opportunities. Um, studios hire all levels. Now, you know, I went to animation school in 2000, 2001. So it was a long time ago when I got out of school, not a lot of opportunities. Like everything was, you needed five years experience. So I did a lot of freelancing. I did a lot of free jobs, free commercials to get going, to build up my portfolio. It took me a long time to kind of break in. And I think that's one of the cool things about now is there's just so many opportunities. I see uh, really talented um, straight out of school artists now that, you know, they've evolved. It's a different game now. So I think, you know, one thing I always tell people that ask me, like, what do they, what do you want on a demo reel? Like I've literally hired people before because they showed me one piece of personal work that was amazing. And sometimes that's all you need. Like, don't try to have tons of different stuff, like focus on something that shows off your skill set, and, um, go for that. You know, less is more, I would say. Yeah, agreed. And then if you want to supplement that with additional little projects that can show other areas of interest, and sometimes that could be even photography. Like we've, uh, uh, I've worked with people in uh, in this, through my years in this uh, industry that had come from model making, from photography, and they are incredible artists. Uh, it's very difficult to train the eye. It's very difficult to train that problem solving part of the brain. And I think that's really what you kind of want to get is get out there, be creative in whatever what that means. Um, and then, as John said, one one piece might be all you need. Or if you want to try to show that you have interest in other areas, just choose little bits of that. But not everything needs to be perfect um, because uh, that's also a quality I see, a quality, it's a characteristic I see in a lot of people is that 
it's really hard to let go sometimes. Like you really want to kind of keep polishing that same piece for weeks, months, and you also need to know when to stop and move on to something else. Anything else you wanted to add as well? Uh, well, I, it's it's true what John's saying about the it being a different world. Um, when I started playing around with CG software, it was very difficult to get and you know, and very hard to get hardware that could run it in like the, the mid '90s. Um, so now to have so much stuff, so many educational versions of software, and so many schools and, and things uh, that have all this information that's available, you, you're not scouring obscure manuals and books and trying to figure out the, <laughs> the, the computer science part of it. Um, it it's, it's really cool. It, it frees up um, people to, to kind of demonstrate their, their, um, their eye to create, you know, it's, for generalism, it's, it's kind of like, composition is just as important as your texturing ability it's it's all it's all in one thing and it can be tricky to hire for it like a lot of us um actually i think this might have been a question i saw but um like a generalist in different studios means different things um sometimes it means you're able to jump from from specialist department to specialist department like you can be an animator one day then you're a modeler um but it, but at distillery it's kind of it, kind of the way that it, they did it at ilm too is um, it's just a group of people that just do the whole shot all the way through, you know, you're doing, we're doing vehicle animation. We're doing, um, we're taking caches and putting them in there. We're just doing everything to get the, the, the image in there. So if, if we're looking at reels, it, it's, it's really, we want to see stuff for, for generalist reels. You want to see, um, a shot that somebody has done a lot of work in. So if they're at a studio, you know, first job and they're working on something and they've done some tiny little part, it's not really representational. So it's almost better to have a good personal project where you've done everything. That's, um, it's, it's more what we look for. Yeah, and, and I just said a little bit there that I think which kind of summarizes this really uh, on the generalist front is more a mentality thing. It's not so much stuck through a software or to a technique. It's more of a way of thinking. It's problem solving. It's being analytical, kind of creative. How do you want to get there? Like we we are a, a company that leans in generalism and most people are generalists here and not everyone has the same strength. It's actually, mm. there's some people that are very strong matte painters. There's some people that are very strong at building things. There's people that are very strong at look having or lighting. Uh, the It's the sum of all parts that will make a group of people, a company like great. Uh, but it's kind of that interest that just makes you breach a little bit further and be like, oh, okay, I've modeled this, but now I'm going to put it in a scene and I'm going to look there and light it and see what that looks like. It's that curiosity, that interest uh, that really breaches into that, and that, when you that have, generalism. When you have someone coming in with a certain strength, it might be, they just might be really good at DMP or something, but you can see that they have the eye and then, the, and then other things can be taught. So there's a lot of people that come in with one or two um, disciplines that, that are very skilled in, but we can, you can tell it's, it's not, it's not hard to you know get get the rest of it out of them so people come in with one or two skills and they can spread to have you know a full spectrum they just you you give them shots and they and they get better i think all of us were specialists at some time in my career i've been a specialist in, in surfacing uh hair a, a lot of character stuff modeling z brush like it just it's very specific jobs on certain shows and then you go through like that for a while until you you kind of build up this repertoire of, of different disciplines. Yeah, I, I remember when I started, I wanted to be a modeler. That's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to do cool models. Uh, I come similar to Aaron, actually. And I didn't know this, Aaron. Actually, we need to talk with a coffee tomorrow. But I come from, <laughs> uh, I also come from architectural visualization. I actually studied multimedia design and I did like 3D for a few months. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. Like, I could I could get into this. At a time, there was much more than some printed manuals. So you kind of read some stuff, install some software at home, almost burn your computer down, and you kind of carry on just experimenting and being curious. and I got a gig in a in a small architectural visualization studio in Portugal, in a tiny little town in the middle of nowhere that no one here would know about. Um, but then that kind of got me going, got me excited, and then I knew I wanted to do like bigger things and explore uh, explore more. And then I moved, into, and that, that's kind of my path. But when I started in VFX, I was like, oh, I really want to do models. That's really cool. Like build things, build. Uh, and then when I got to VFX, I was like, well, actually, that just doing that all day is not for me. Like I and I. I have friends that love to do that day in and day out. But for me, I was like, I, I kind of want to see what happens to this model after after the fact. Like, I want to 
take it into the next level. And I want to start thinking about storytelling and all these other things. And that's where my drive to go into this kind of more generalist sort of role came from. See, so just, just to let everybody know, Noman's not just an amazing school in Hollywood. We also put on streams where people get to know each other and they learn things that they don't even know. <laughs> so, you know, well, how many schools can say that they do that? Um, okay, so biggest challenge. Working on the show specifically, what what was the, the biggest challenge for, for the team? Or uh, why don't we say... For the team that did you all notice and then for each of you individually? Hmm. I mean, I think because we're such fans of the game, mm. you know, there is there's a there's a level of quality we wanted to hit because we just knew no one was gonna accept any less. Like we had to get over we had to get over that bar. And sometimes things that you think are simple, like shingles on a roof. When you have to add something there that's just not there, um, those can be deceptively difficult. So, like, we definitely had shots where, like, we couldn't get the shingles to look right. And it's, like, the shingles you would think are the easiest thing to do here. But, like, to get it to look photo real everywhere in every shot is is a tall order. So, I would say, like, there was definitely um, – there was a bar that we wanted to hit for, like, for me personally, especially, like, supervising the show that – you know, I like I wanted to do right by Alex. Like I have a major respect for him and Craig. Like their collaboration with us was so good. You know, I wanted to make sure that we did that whole thing justice, and that was um, that was a big that was a big hurdle that I wanted to get over. So then, John, you're the reason why Aaron was creeping out his neighbors because yes. he was standing in front of the house. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It's true. He's a wanted man now. I'm sorry. <laughs> So what about for the for the you other two? What what uh, what was kind of like a big hurdle while you were working on it? Uh, you want to go first, Aaron? Uh, sure. We're talking about shingles. Um, <laughs> the shingles were they, they, they're tough because shingles can can wear in all different kinds of ways. It depends on the climate. Was it you know was it hot and arid? Was it humid? Was there was it in on the shadow side? All the time was it so that you can find reference to justify just about anything you can do uh, texture wise so to, to to find something that fits into what the um the the client wants to see is tricky because there's just so much there's so much range of things that can happen and i'm like walking around here we're in bc everything's it's it's um right on the ocean there, there's there's mold moss and mold and stuff growing on everything it's like that's you can get tons of photo reference there, but then you can find online what happens in Arizona. It's completely different. So there's just tons of iterations of ref and trying things and seeing what sticks and then combining them. And um, so like just the level of, of, of uh, damage and, and detritus, I'm going to keep saying that word. It's an awesome word. Um, but yeah, that was the tricky thing is finding that balance of what and what happened over the years and then finding that smooth transition from one year to the next which um how much is is justifiable uh initially they were kind of um a bit subdued they didn't want to make it go over the top um like the game kind of was is like famous for being like crazy um overgrown um but we ended up pushing further that direction in the end and it's i think it was a good call it it, it really um help tell the story but yeah that was the tricky part is just getting the levels of, of damage and destruction over the years yeah i think i mean i i was gonna go with the same as john like really working on an ip this big the like people get really passionate about these sort of content i know i did like when i heard about the last of us i was like oh are they gonna ruin something that means yeah. so much to me and so many other people especially with a track record of ad adapting video games i was like ah, this is kind of scary so there's all these kind of side of you that is like i really want to work on this i really don't even want to look at this i want to be part of it but i don't really want to ruin it so Definitely for that, but I don't want this to sound like a cop out, so I'm going to pick something else. Um, I think for me, um, so I joined the distill this team here at the distillery, and I knew some of the people here from before, but I joined this team uh, when we were starting, The Last of Us was kind of starting on the early days. Um, and I come, like, I've worked with a bunch of different packages, like 
pretty much every company I've worked in in the past, I've worked with a different sort of set of renders and uh, and softwares. And coming here uh, and to Max, I hadn't really worked uh, in production with Max since my architectural visualization days. Uh, so it was definitely like a, a, a test of fire of getting in, getting uh, setting up the mall, and uh, getting hands on with a new package on an IP with this sort of a caliber and level with the expectations of the team here, but also the client and all that, there was definitely a high stake uh, here. I definitely felt like, all right, so it's game time, game on here. Uh, so there was definitely a lot of pressure and it was like, in a good way, no, no, in a, oh, I, I want to go home now kind of way. It was exciting at the same time for sure. Uh, yeah, that, that was probably my, my second challenge. Thanks, John. So, so yeah, it's, it seems like the biggest challenge as a whole was the IP, right? Like it is just like, oh man, just, just touching it, getting close to it at that point. It's like, okay, here, here we go. Right. I'm going to put my stamp on it. Um, like on, on that topic of the IP too, like, I think, you know, when we first started on Billstown, for example, we are just putting roofs on things. We don't have audio. We don't really, you know, we've seen a few little cuts, but you don't, really start to hone in on how special a story is going to be like you don't really know until you're a little bit further along and as we were getting towards the end and we saw some cuts we were like man this episode is going to be really good like you like forget all of the vfx stuff like just the episode itself the story the acting that whole thing coming together the music it was like man this is going to be really good and i'll i'll never forget when we watched it as a team in our theater downstairs uh that we walked out of that room and i think the entire team was completely in tears like everybody was crying like there was like no one cared it was like we all just let loose and um it was it's a it was a pretty unique moment that i'll never forget yeah yeah so so it sounds like you get your team together to watch bill's town and then on fridays you all watch this movie called grave of the fireflies which yeah, you yeah no, no no <laughs> no if you haven't seen it no don't yeah, <laughs> yeah. you can watch that movie i love it and that's it yeah, yeah. i love that's that one movie. it is it is a gut-wrenching film yeah uh, I'll, I'll also add something into like the IP thing because there's this romantic idea about all these projects we work on and I have to say actually you know after over 10 years in the industry I can count in uh, the fingers of one hand the, the projects I've worked in that I'm like I'm a really fan a, a big fan of the, the final movie I love the projects for different reasons I've worked in shows with teams that I love the team I love the work sometimes the, the most fun work and project actually no some of the most fun maybe first second place there's a bit of a dispute maybe but some of the more most fun projects i've worked was maybe some of the worst films i've worked on but the team was great the the content of what we're doing was really fun was really great and some of the biggest ips and the more exciting stuff i worked on uh and like i really love the final product the project itself was not great it was not fun it was too much um going on from a political point of view, whatever it, it may have been um you know, and this one is actually one of those rare cases where you actually get both. Like you, we got to work on something incredible, like the, the show that is great. Uh, I still love the episode three after having watched it four times in a, in a row, pretty much. And, uh, you know, and the whole series is, is, is solid uh, as a whole. Uh, and I think that finding that and then working with a team that you enjoy, working with a, a, a good collaborative client all these things aligning is actually extremely difficult. Like it doesn't happen very often. Um, so I think that is, if you were going to have a question about highlights of the, the this project, that was it. So I've uh, answered in advance. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> so um, for each, and, and so these are these are two separate episodes, but timeline wise. So when you're when you're working on everything that you from from start to being finished with it and handing it off. How long does that usually take? What does that usually look like for your team? I mean, as a whole, Tilu was, we started in roughly like April 2022. And I think we wrapped in just early February 2023. So not quite a year that we were, we were on it. I mean, we did, we did about 400 and something shots, um, you know, on Bill's Town, uh, 
a lot of that was beauty cleanup. Like it was some comp only stuff, you know, we had a couple hundred environment shots and then some smaller cleanup shots. Uh, the mall I think was about 30 or 40 shots all together again with, a, you know, a dozen or so cleanups on top of that. Um, so that was kind of like the big broad, uh, kind of time, time frame for, for the whole show. And how long did it take to get like approvals on, uh, of, you know, stuff? So you would chop it up, you would send it. Uh, how long did it, did that usually go around? I mean, that, that depends, you know, like, like Pedro was saying, like that, the animation of the lights for the mall, like on paper, when we knew we were going to have to do that, like in my experience, I was like, this is going to go on for a while. We are going to, you know, int intricately animate these lights. There's going to be notes on timing. They're going to want to do different versions of that. And <laughs> like we got that one out of the gate on like version one, which is kind of unheard of. Um, so that is not expected, you know, and then there's some stuff like shingles, or we did a we did a shot of a guy going into um, some sparks on a, an electric fence, and that had more versions than the animation of them all, which you wouldn't expect. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes some things you know are harder than they seem, and sometimes things are, you know, they they kind of roll. Like I said earlier, the universe aligns, and it kind of rolls your way. So. Yeah, there's, there's always those shots. You kind of usually you kind of pick the hero shots, the ones that show the most, and you work them up there, and you kind of like spend all your time on that. And then there's some same as shots that just kind of go for free once you've unlocked the look. Uh, and there's certain things you can identify pretty early on that are that just go the whole span, and they end up finaling like, and when they have to, you know, like a week before it airs, kind of thing. Yeah. So then. Um, Continuing on with kind of like you know shipping out stuff and iterations, when you when you're looking at a shot, and you had, you had mentioned earlier, Aaron, that you that they uh, set dressed a little bit, they put a couple of leaves on the ground, and you were like, that's not enough leaves, I want more leaves, right? Yeah. How do you how do you eyeball that? Like, do you just it's just a gut feeling? Like, well, come on, if it was a post apocalyptic place that had zombies running around, there would be well, more leaves. Often that's part of the turnover. Like the client will give us this thing and say, you know, we did some set dressing, but we just, there's, we didn't have enough. We need to put more here. Or there's a story point now. Like when someone starts to think about it from the story point of view and the, you get the, um, you're thinking about the previous shot and the, the cuts and stuff, you just need to add more in this location because it was in this shot, that kind of thing. Um, so, and then there's certain times that we can just kind of try our own thing. Like the client maybe didn't explicitly ask for it, but because we're already in there doing this, we can add a bit more and then they might, you know, like that or ask us to tone it down. So yeah. like usually I, you kind of push. Yeah. Like we had a lot of freedom to, to kind of push what we needed to do. Um, but again, I think, you know, we were always looking at reference. We were always collecting reference, sending it to Alex, getting him to kind of show us like, Oh, I like that. I like this. Don't do this. I don't like this one. You know, we try to hone in onto something slowly um, and photography is the, that's just how you do that. You know, you just, you, we, we're always looking at real world situations. Yeah. Sometimes yeah, it takes a while to, to unlock a, a certain look and it's hard to, to sell an idea to a, to a client if they, de they can't see the final product and it takes some time, some time to get there. So the, the photography reference helps show them what your target is so they can agree if that's the right way to go. Yeah. yeah, and that's an advice for everybody. Like, never, and I, it is, might sound like a rant because I actually go to people's desks and I review work often and I'm like, what's the reference you're looking at? Because don't underestimate reference. Even if we're doing something fantastic, or even if, if you start and if you keep your eye on something real, the odds of succeeding and the odds of being able to own in on what you're trying to achieve are much, much higher. And that's not just when you first grab and you're first looking at using the leaves example, when you first put leaves on something, you just don't look at a couple of pictures and then you put them away and that's it. Like it's for lighting, it's for later on text, whatever you're doing, whatever stage you're at, like looking at reference and keep reminding yourself is for me, it's one of the biggest tools that we have and that we need to lean on. Yeah, it's like you look at a Star Destroyer or something, and it, it's got elements that are on ships and on ports and things, and they, they're using that for scale reference and the types of details. You don't have to find the exact thing that you need to build. You can find anything that's kind of similar. Oh, yeah, that's uh, that's OG kit bashing right there. Um, yeah. Okay, so 
we, we, I'm, I'm, I'm dissecting this, this list, but it does seem one thing that came up a lot was the hardware specifically. People are curious about the hardware. You can allude to what y'all use. The, yeah. the not proprietary stuff, the stuff that isn't locked behind, you know, the security guards. We actually have a, like an array of different machines from the machines that are on our render farm to the user machines. Different users have different needs. So it's actually being a small company, it's not like we have you know a deal and we just get the same machine for everybody. And then we have update every few years, uh, however the, the, the deal would be. Here, we actually have a little bit more customized setups for, for different people. But like if you really want to get into the details, like a common workstation, my pack like 128 gigs of ram i have a uh like my machine has an nvidia rtx a4000 and it's an amd ryzen 9 3900 uh cpu so and that's kind of a normal uh workstation sort of spec uh but it really varies a lot obviously we have production stuff that doesn't have as high requirements uh on the hardware uh, but we try to keep like a baseline because uh, the way it works in studios, in big studios, and also in, well, in, in small studios is even more critical, is that once we pack up and we're not doing work, the, the whole network just starts using, all, like the render farm starts taking on all the machines that are not being used to start rendering. So all the machines, kind, you kind of want to have a baseline of what the minimum would be. So you, kinda, you can predict that your jobs are going to go through when they start propagating into the, the rest of the floor. Yeah. And... The, so the whole time you're building a scene, you're keeping in mind the specs of the machine you want to render on, and you want to keep them as low as possible for the, the job at hand. So you there's certain things you can do that optimize for memory. Um, you don't want to have huge poly counts for things in the distance, stuff like that. Um, but certain times you get into situations where we just have such a huge amount of ge geometry. Just, um, I mean, I've had scenes on, on some films where we had, I want to say, hundreds of trillions of polygons and you you have to crush it with memory so sometimes like we have machines that are, are for this task that are like uh, double the 128 so 256 i guess um, gigs of memory and and they're like the, the amd thread rippers and they have just like crazy number of cores and those are the ones where you just want to crush it through if you have to get that renders out fast um and and some jobs even on those machines can take up to four hours a frame um but that's a rare situation where you just need to push it through. Uh, normally, we have things more optimized and running on these uh, 128s, but memory is a, is a big deal when working on large environments. Yeah, but so then... Uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, well, you, you don't really want, like, you, and this kind of scales in every company differently, but you don't really, like, we have machines that have 512 gigs of RAM. Like, you don't want right. to do a scene for that machine, and then, then you only stuck. have, yeah, you only have... 10, 20, 30, depending on how many machines you have, while all these other machines are much lower memory, but you cannot use them. So it's always about having this baseline, like Aaron is saying, you kind of optimize to like the standard, like every company will have a standard defined of what is a, a, a machine like that you expect to render your work, you aim for that, and you only really unlock these the beasts when you really need them. Yeah, but those big machines can run multiple jobs at once. So if they're more optimized jobs, it can run three jobs at once. So then you you still to to who asked that uh, very high level hardware question? There you go. <laughs> that was a very detailed answer. But then you render all this stuff and and just to double back for a second, you said you watched Bill's Town on a on a screen like a theater. You all have a theater at Distillery. We do. We definitely have have a theater at Distillery. Um, these are some shots of our studio actually because uh, we're in Vancouver um outside and we, we actually have a rooftop patio which is pretty sweet um you know and we put up lots of inspiration around all the time like a lot of a lot of students only put up like posters of what they've worked on but we just like to be constantly inspired so we put up stuff that we think is cool um you know we've got we've got some really neat stuff around the studio people bring in a lot of stuff uh on their desks we got a few arcade machines and pool table foosball table like we try to make it cozy here. Like we spend a lot of time uh, at work. We're a hybrid studio, so we're we're um, we're in office three days a week, and we're remote two days of the week, which is pretty cool. We seem to like that a lot. Um, we like dogs, so dogs come into the office all the time. We got a lot of dog friends that are always running around, which is cool. It's just a really 
chill vibe. You know, it almost feels like we kind of designed our main studio floor to be like a feels like you're in a living room almost. Uh, people have a lot of space. They get a lot of space to put cool stuff up. Um, you can see our theater here uh, and our render farm, which is behind some Jurassic Park uh, stuff, uh, little <laughs> Easter eggs there for people that like Jurassic Park. Um, but that's our that's our theater. You know, we can pretty much fit everyone in there. Um, we're definitely a little you know a little bit bigger now up in the 70s, but you know it's pretty comfy. We've done some pretty nice viewings of stuff in there. Um, but yeah, so that that place is is super cool. We watched we watched both episodes of um of the last of us in there with the team and it was a, it was a really good time. That's awesome. I mean, that looks like it would be super fun. I mean, do you ever just like work on something for a really long time and you're like, "Okay, we got this one shot done. Let's just go watch it in the theater?" Yeah, I mean, like we it's always cool to just look at your work on the big screen. I like I always remember like at ILM we would go into the theater and look at it massively and it just looks way different than you're looking at it uh, on a little screen, especially like after COVID where a lot of people were working remote, like um, you get so used to like looking at your stuff like on a phone or like on a tiny monitor. Um, so it's always, it's always cool to see, to see it back up on the big screen. And then that star destroyer, did you all build it together? And who had the idea to put the LEDs in it? Because that's our that's, that's our CTO Troy. I think he built that with his kids. Um, he likes to have it sit right on the edge of his desk at the precipice. <laughs> I don't know why it like gives everybody anxiety. I'm so afraid I'm gonna come in one morning and that thing's just gonna be in a million pieces on the ground. <laughs> it's a power move. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's the hardest thing to move around for sure. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. But there's a legal theme for sure. There's a, that way. There's a few more here. That's yeah. uh, there's definitely love for Legos in this office. Yeah. That's always good. But you don't glue them. You live your life on the edge. You're yeah. like, oh no, of course. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to leave safe. So your your studio, will we'll, we just got to see it. As far as it covering uh, visual effects, you do modeling, texturing, lighting, uh, all that, and combined uh, with the visual effects and, and compositing, or, or do you kind of like, no, we're really in, I mean, it sounds like you said. Uh, we do, we do right, everything. Template. So we, we do everything um, all the way to final comp. I think, you know, we're not really in an animation or, or an effects house. Um, we do little bits of that, but it's more to support the generalist workflow that you're doing you know we have scenes that sometimes have smoke or fire and we'll get in there and do a little bit do a little bit of effects we're not doing massive effects simulations we're not doing character animations or characters that's not our wheelhouse we stay focused on environment work and compositing and sometimes there's little bits of animation that go with that or effects like aaron was mentioning earlier sometimes we animate vehicles thing you know we had a couple shots on on tila where we had to put helicopters in the distance and we were animating yeah. helicopters flying around um spaceships. so yeah spaceships you know we're you know we spent a long time at ILM. We're really close friends with Lucasfilm as well. Uh, we we get still get to work on some Star Wars properties, so um, we we get to animate some ships still, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, it's it's mainly supporting the generalist environment work, and, and then, a lot of layout animation too, camera work. Yeah, and then with that, uh, working with other studios. Uh, how how does that work usually? How close do you work with other studios, and how do you handle like communications and feedback with them? I mean, it depends on the show. I mean, uh, on The Last of Us specifically, we didn't have a lot of shared work. Like Bill's Town was kind of our episode for the most part, and we were the ones that had to do the work to final for that. Um, same for the 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 mall episode. Um, there's only you know, we didn't do any of the creature stuff in the mall. You know, there was some, there was some, uh, there was some clickers in there that were chasing people. Uh, that wasn't us. Um, when there's overlap, like we, we, we share information. We get on calls with other studios and we talk um, and figure out how we need to uh, attack things together as a team. Um, again, it's it can be really collaborative as well based on on what you're doing. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I'm, I mean. Uh, this goes without saying, hopefully all of the, the social and all the announcing that we did about this stream ahead of time, uh, spoiler warning. Oh. <laughs> but if you, if you haven't seen any of these episodes yet, 
do yourself a favor and and go uh, on to your HBO or it's Max now, I guess. Yeah, yeah uh, I think it's just your Max, Max account, yeah. uh, your friend's Max account, your mom's Max account, whatever. Watch it as soon as possible. Now, I'm someone that wants to stay up to date with Distillery. How do I do that? How do I stay up to date with y'all? Know what you what you're coming up with? What's coming up next? Or what what do I do to stay to stay yeah. up to date with y'all? I mean, we we have an active Instagram and a LinkedIn page, and I would say those are the spots to go to to see what we're up to. Um, you know, we have recruitment stuff out there when we're looking to hire. Uh, we're showing off uh, reels that we've done, or uh, you know, when trailers come out that are official, um, we try to promote the type of work that we're doing. So those are the places to go to go look at our website as well. Um, you know, we have contact in there that people can uh, look at job postings or um, just shoot us a message. Fantastic. Well, you know what, y'all? I think we did it. I think I think we successfully had a great evening with Distillery. I want to I want to thank you all so much. I was going to ask at the end to get a couple of deadlifts in, but you know, next time we'll get <laughs> Oh yeah. I next forgot time. to put more weight on there. I was going to uh, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> with the stormtrooper helmet on and we're all take it on. I appreciate you all so much for, for coming and doing this talk. I'm sure everybody in the chat feels the same. If you are interested in seeing more streams like this, make sure you follow us on Instagram. You can check us out, uh, Noman School. You can follow us on pretty much any social, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever you're looking for. Uh, just come follow us and stay up to date with all these amazing events like this. I mean, this was so fun, super informative. Again, thank you all so much for coming. And, you know, I'll see y'all next time. We got to do this again. We got to yeah. do this again. Yeah. Again. We we'll definitely, talk. we'll definitely be doing this again. I'm sure. Okay. Thank cool. you for having so us. The next awesome. amazing project we'll, we'll go through and we'll talk about that. And then uh, y'all can ship me some poutine so I can eat it while I'm here. And then I'll <laughs> that can be arranged. That can be arranged. Yeah. You know awesome. I like your studio. <laughs> yeah. We just Thank y'all so much. Just want to say quickly too, like thanks, Noman, for having us. Like we really appreciate it. It's super cool. We always love talking about this stuff, and it's always fun where people get to see uh, a little bit of behind the scenes of what we do. Yeah, and awesome work in your reel. Lots of really cool yeah, work that you showed us over here. Totally. Well, thank you so much, y'all. I really appreciate that. If you're interested in also making some awesome work, go ahead and hit us up at www.noman.edu. If you have any questions on how to get started on your artistic journey, go ahead and email us at info at And until next time, we'll see you. Cool. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>